Well, hello there, everybody. How are y'all doing? Thank you, Cosmic Travelers. You know, I think we're all Cosmic gypsy, Gypsies of some kind. Uh, but thank you. Thank you for dropping in and uh, being a part of this, well, <laughs> adventure, ride, trip. I don't know. You can add whatever descriptive word fits for you, but it's a interesting place to say the least. One of the things I know about this realm is that words count, words mean something, and particularly words that are energy filled, such as favor. And speaking favor over us all is really some positive charged energy. So soak it up, have seconds if you want, and if you're really thirsty or hungry, go ahead and get thirds and fourths, free for the taking. And while you're there, may there always be nothing missing, nothing broken. So there we go. Hello, Soul Tribe. What's happening, everybody? Steve, Mr. Floyd, I saw Brenda in there. Street Mom, haven't seen you in a while, dear. Good to see you. Deborah Sloan, much love to you. Nina, how you doing? Steve, hello. Lost in space. What's up, Lori? Doris, good to see you. Kel, good to see you. Lady Ellie. Good to see you as well, my dear. Joyce, how you doing? <laughs> so, <clears throat> cold here. And it was 82 degrees just three days ago. It's hot, humid. Now we got uh, sleet, so figure it out. Bonnie, what's up? RF, good to see you as well. Farzana, how are you, my dear? It has, ew, wow, it, it has been a long time since I have seen you. Um, so good to see you. How is everything? How are your studies? I hope they're going well. And, uh, yeah, sending favor out to our good brother. And thank you for those who join in that. We just don't do this just to be saying, you know, like the former religion I was in, you know, it always got to me when you see these people saying, oh, I love you, love you, brother, love you, sister. And, they're just saying it because you're supposed to say it. But when we speak, it's energy charge. So, Nathan, we got you in the uh, crosshairs, brother, surrounding you with favor and uh, yeah, peace. Peace that surmounts all understanding. That's the kind of peace I'm talking about. So, uh, John, good to see you. Hey, that was a funny vid video. If you've not seen the video of uh, when Saturday Night Live was actually funny, uh, Phil Hartman, Lowell Lovitz, um, John Lovett, that's what it was, because he actually starred in that movie, <clears throat> Mom and Dad Save the World. A crazy movie. Anyway, it's when Messel Odyssey's The Devil comes into court to collect on a contract that he had made with an 18-year-old hairstylist. It's funny. Go and check it out. Trina, how are you doing, my dear? Good to see you, Source Frequency. I think I saw Goddess Sabrina. I would love to have you on, Goddess, sometime. If you would like to come on. Love to have you. So, here is the question I put out there in the title. You know, I can tell you exactly how imperfection came into existence. Do I know the answer? First, let's go and do some physics review. Matter, antimatter. Gravity, anti-gravity. Two separate forces with laws that govern each force. And the commonality of the law is, is that two forces cannot occupy the same space. That's why, you know, you have what happens is the annihilation theory, theory or principle, that you cannot put two opposing forces into the same space. They'll annihilate each other. 
So getting back to, well, where did imperfection come? If perfection existed, how could imperfection come into existence? Well, the answer is very simple. Perfection never exists. Perfection does not exist. It is impossible for perfection to exist in this realm. In fact, if you think about perfection in its complete etymology of the word, it implies that there's nothing else. Once perfection is reached, what else is there? And my biblical training was my philosophy. You know, that theology just gets into you. Was that, well, there was this bad cat, you know, named Satan. Lucifer, they, they don't even know. They get the two confused. Anyway, one or the other, somehow or another, was perfect in its creation. And they really give this lame excuse that, well, it looked upon itself, got a hard on, and said, well, I can do better than this God. Now, if you follow that narrative, well, that narrative is comes from many other more ancient cultures, but let's just keep with the modern uh, script, that so perfection somehow or another bred into existence imperfection. It's impossible. But here's most likely the other alternative to that. What Lucifer saw was imperfection to begin with. And as any good entrepreneur would do, says, well, I can come up with a better mousetrap. So the answer is perfection doesn't exist. It's an egregore. It's a thought worm in our perception, limited perception of reality and the so-called ethereal realm. There is no such thing as perfection. I dare say that if you were ever to achieve perfection, you'd no longer exist. What would be the perfect? There would be no purpose. None. You've achieved perfection. Well, else is there? So, there you go on that. Um, Joyce says a perception. Exactly. There you go. Uh, <laughs> they had cat Satan. <laughs> Sky boy, I love you, man. Mary Wins, how you doing? Hello, Bonnie. Shadow Files, love it. So, that's that's part of one of the spells. I mean, I really thought for most of my life that this this one thing that it it said it was you know it was god how dare i question that and never could get the full thing in my head i struggled most of my christian so called walk and i was anointed i had the gifts of the holy spirit working in me I was more dedicated to my religion than 99.9% .9 of those who call themselves Christians, in this case, uh, ever were. When I was a pro pra prayer warrior, um, we would typically get to the church like at 5 o'clock in the morning. Out of a church that was 5,000 so-called members, at the most you would have in there would be 10 people. But we did some powerful battle, which brought me to one of those epiphanies. When I look at the occult and we study these grimoires that are written, some are old, but by the vast majority of them, if there are originals, they're in collector's hands. They're in very private groups that don't share knowledge. They don't. What knowledge we can gar garner uh, on the outside um, may aid us. These 
so-called spiritual beings, they have knowledge. They'll commune with you. They desire for that. And when I was a prayer warrior, I was fighting in the Holy Spirit, mostly speaking in tongues, but there was battle going on. And how odd is it now that I look back on those very entities that I was in battle with, now I'm aligned with. <laughs> Hell of a thing, isn't it? Hello, Ruby, how you doing? Lauren, good to see you, darling. How are you? Um, <laughs> just, just stating the truth. And I guess that is one of the reasons why I'm not afraid of them. I did battle against them. I went into the ring, 16 rounds. Sometimes I got my ass kicked, but most of the time I kicked their ass. And when I think about these gods and goddesses that have been banished from our lexicon, it's only because of the internet that this knowledge is even out there. I dare say that if the internet had not been invented, it the occult would have been exactly what it was always, very much secretive, very secluded in its orientation of those who had it. Um, and when I realize and I look back, you know, that's what makes people like us, and I'm not alone in this, not at all, that's what makes us such a threat, such a danger. Particularly those who come out of what I would say more of the Pentecostal um, side of the equation. The Pentecostal, really, you have to, I, I still admire the denomination, at least the, the egregore of thought, and that is Pentecostal folks really believe and do this existence in this other realm. It's it's quite amazing when I look back. I didn't know my opponent's name so often. I didn't need to know because I had legions of angels that I could let loose on them. And then you can stand in proxy. Uh, it's actually in the Battle of Jericho, uh, standing in the gap, standing in the hedge. You can do that. You can literally uh, be the proxy of the person of focus. And if it's one, praying in the spirit, uh, really powerful things happen. But if you get a group speaking in the spirit, focusing on one individual for one purpose, um, I look back now, that's a that's pagan. But the principle works, regardless of what environment it is used in. So, since I was in that mindset, that mind trap, that, you know, there were those who were good and those who were bad, and of course, I was taking one point of view, one perspective as truth. It's the problem. If your truth is only predicated on one side or one opinion, it's not truth. It's an opinion at best, a hypothetical. It's when it's balanced with an opposing view, do you find out how that truth really settles. And so that gets us into where we are today. So Perfection doesn't exist. It may be a lofty goal, nothing wrong with that, but I seriously doubt if um, if you ever achieved it, you would really want to. It's odd because, well, practice makes perfect. I don't know. I guess if you are in the uh, reincarnation camp, that would be a great theme, you know, practice makes perfect. Because guess what? You're never going to be perfect. You are who you are, whether that's imperfectness in its perfect manifestation. Well, you figure it out. But it's true. 
And so we're in a time where, as I, I have come to the conclusion, it's time to evict the current gods of this modern reality. They have failed across the board, all of them. And it makes me wonder then about what we're going to get into now, the grimoire of Tiamat, because it, it's very evident that our, spe our ancestors had a belief system that in many cases is still very much in use today. Every religion seems to borrow or use the same foundational structure. And when you come into the Sumerian lore, you know, uh, Dr. Noel Kramer, I've done, so in one of my uh, all-time favorite uh, playlist is the 39 first of Sumer. And again, what makes it significant about the Sumerian record is the fact that it was the first evidence of what we would call printed word. It is said with the Sumerians that they became aware of history, which is an advancement in consciousness, where you suddenly begin to realize that history will be the one to determine your existence, your reality, your place in that history. We all have that. I came into a time into this realm, and even looking into the ethereal realm, it's like there's slots, but yeah. And so when I exit this realm, for myself here, there will always be, at least in radio waves, me. If you have your channel out there and you're out there, same thing for you. You're, you're, you're eternal, baby. Uh, but the thing about it is, is that if you ignore history, then what happens is that makes it very difficult to progress forward because you're going to have this huge gap. So when I say it's time to evict the current gods that are out here, I mean, I look at the god that I worshipped. And number one, I don't believe if a god really is a god that it once worshipped. Worshippers are a pain in the ass. I mean, seriously, you got the whiners, you got the biners, you got the ones who say, oh, God, help me. And then you got the cursors. Well, you just go to hell. You're going to go to, and you know, you're going, oh, okay. But that is their whole perception. And you look at what these gods have done. You know, when I was in the corporate world, we had yearly reviews. And those reviews were important. Not only was it a review of what I was able to accomplish in a stated set of goals the previous year, but it was also under examination how I executed, what was the strategy, and then most importantly, how much revenue was brought in on that. And those reviews would determine what my bonus was going to be and then what my raise was going to be. Very important. And I, I say that it's, par, it's far past due that we give the gods of the modern era a job review. And I think everyone would agree that virtually all of them, I don't care what religion you are, I'm a universalist in this aspect, they've all failed. But the And, and the thing about it is, you have to ask them, then, then what was your goal? Was it to kill us, to keep us separated, the bifurcations, you know, what? Um, you look at how every religion has its point, and, and what they got to do is that they got to get new converts, and again, what have these gods produced? I haven't seen peace. I haven't seen love. Name me one country that their motto is, we send love. We're a country of love. We're a country of lovers. You know, you laugh, but there is none. 
Love is not in the headlines of MSNBC. They're a hate channel. CNN, Fox News, CBS, ABC, all of them. Their whole idea is to separate. Yeah. And it's there's no unification. You either believe what this one says, or then you're the enemy. And if you're the enemy, I mean, it's just, you know, so where do these gods come into? You know, you, you have, if you're a conservative, apparently you have to be a Christian too. Why? Conservative values are good. I don't, and, and to hijack it by a religion or a sector of a religion is ridiculous. And then mortify that, and it's mortified, into a political belief. Now, if the gods don't exist, that this is the only god, then something's wrong. Because there's no perfection anywhere, never has been. And yet people won't commit. That's the thing. You know, I don't build altars to gods. If I'm a god, then there has to be equal respect. Now, I respect authority. I respect position. Most of the time, those are earned, not given. If authority is ever given, typically it's going to be messed up by the person to whom it's given to. And getting back to this, so I can dig that there would be a hierarchy. But if I am of the same court, then my title alone entitles me to have the same respect. And that's how I approach it. Now, I don't know what our ancestors believed in. You know, there is so much today about the Anunnaki's and, you know, but what I fail is that I never see the full connection. Because it wasn't just the Samaritans, but the Samaritans are the ones who started it. And if you study the tablets, and you can learn to read cuneiform, it, the Samaritan cuneiform, it's not that difficult, really. And once you understand how they wrote, and, and it was painstakingly for each symbol, each letter that well, it was a symbol that represented a letter, um, yeah, because they were the first true clay stones written in clay, which is amazing because those records, again, were lost for thousands and thousands of years while these other religions suddenly came up and began to develop their narratives as though they're the truth. Yet their story is very more recent than the Samaritan tablets. And if they had known that the Samaritan tablets existed, they would have destroyed them. And we would have never had the understanding of the key that unlocked the very real probability of a set of beings that either were related to or were subjugated to. About a gray area on those two. So let's get right into it. I'm just saying it's time that these gods have a review and they failed. They have failed across the board. It's time maybe to bring back the ones that were banished. And part of that story, literally, uh, as we get into this, and this is going to be a couple of day long series, different shows. The first thing we have to really get in, this is short. This is the in Yuma. Elish, this is the Arcadian seal impressions, the world of the gods. Now, I, I, I'm not a Zachariah Stitchin fan. Um, unfortunately, he made a blunder, and he really fucked things up. Um, his, his understanding was that of a child to that that you would find a person who would hold a PhD degree, a doctorate. And that's what caused me. I mean, I have his book. I have his whole anthology of books. And there for a while, I was thinking, holy shit, man. I mean, look what this guy is saying, you know. And 
come to find out when you have the the world uh dr noah kramer university of chicago he is he was the first sumerologist to ever receive a doctorate degree in sumerian history culture now these gods that we adapt in our minds that they must be real they must exist somehow well it's interesting because the Sumerians were a very intelligent society, a culture, which leads me to believe that if they had, in fact, spaceports, which there's collaboration that there was something like that, then who were these gods? Were they cosmic travelers? They existed. And if they have been banished, why? And could we bring them back? Because the evidence shows that when they were here, there seemed to be more stability, but what we're going to find out, it, their culture was not all that stable. There was great competition going on. And we certainly mimic those characteristics. So this is the gods of the, again, the Inuma, Elish. We talked about this a little bit yesterday. And was that a great show? with Trina and Jennifer. Wow. So you have the Apsu, which is fresh water, which is Tiamat, which is salt water. This equals the Lamu and the Lahamu, which is the Anshar and the Kisar, which then becomes Anu, the sky, Demkina, or which is Ia, and then Marduk. Marduk is the central character here. This guy, and I have got books that I've read about him. If I was right now looking at a roulette table, I would probably put my money, to double it real quickly, that the, um, the number is going to be red, Marduk, that he still exists. Or, Yeah, I don't think they went anywhere. All right, so the Inuma, Elish, which are the first two words of the epic and mean simply, when on high, is the creation myth of ancient Mesopotamia. Now, you know, why I didn't ever study this more when, when I was studying and, you know, into the ministry and what have you? But then again, I don't know if my mind would have been able to actually perceive what was really being said. Anyway. This is the Babylonian version of a much older Sumerian myth, and originally the chief figure of the myth was Enyel, the Sumerian storm god. When Babylon conquered the rest of Mesopotamia and established the old Babylonian Empire around 1800 BCE, it became necessary to explain how the local god of Babylon, Marduk, had now become supreme among the gods. Something's happening. Therefore, the older Sumerian myth of creation was retold, and Marduk was substituted for Enlil. Wow. Hmm. Isn't that special? All right. So this is the actual from the uh, cuneiform. When on high, the heaven had not been named. Firm ground below had not been called by name. Not but primordial, Absu, their begetter, and Mumu. We got sleet hitting the window, and I'm sorry. It was saying, what in the world? All right. Uh, Mumu, Tiamat, she who bore them all, their waters co mingling as a single body. No reed, but had been matted, no marshland had appeared. This is older than the book of Genesis. But what do we just read there? We just read the first three verses of the book of Genesis. Yeah. When no gods, whatever, had been brought into being, in the beginning, huh? Unnamed, their destinies yet undermined, 
Then it was that the gods were emerged from within them. Lamu and Lahumu were came forth, were called by name, before they had grown in age and statue. And Shear and Kishar were shaped more mighty than the others. They extended the days, added on the years. Anu was their heir, rival of his father. Verily, Anu, Anshar's firstborn, was his equal. Anu sired his image, New Demud. This New Demud was the master of his father, of broad wisdom, understanding, mighty in strength, mightier by far than his grandfather, Anshar. He had no rival among the gods. His brothers, the divine brothers, banded together. They disturbed Tiamat as they rushed here and there. Indeed, they distraught and tormented Tiamat by their boisterous myrrh in the dwellings of heaven. Absu could not diminish their clamor, and Tiamat was dumbfounded at their ways. Their doings were loathsome to him, offensive and overbearing were their ways. Then Absu, the begetter of great gods, cried out, addressing Mumu, his visor. O oh, Mumu, my visor, who rejoices my spirit, come hither and let us go to Tiamat. They went and sat down before Tiamat, exchanging counsel about the gods, their offspring. Absu, opening his mouth, said unto radiant Tiamat, their ways are truly abominable unto me. By day I find no relief, nor repose by night. I will destroy, I will wreck their ways, that quiet may be restored. Let us have rest. As soon as Tiamat heard this, she was troubled and called out to her husband. Very interesting. I mean, we're going to dissect this more, but think about this. She cried out, and she raged all alone, injecting woe into her mood. What? Should we destroy that which we have produced? Their ways indeed are most troublesome, but let us practice kindness. Then answered Mumu, addressing counsel, giving counsel to Absu, rude and ungracious was Mamu's advice. Destroy my father, their rebellious ways. They shall, then shall you have relief by day and rest by night. When Apsu heard this, his face grew luminous because of the evil he planned against his godly sons. He embraced Mumub by the neck as he sat down on his knees to kiss him. Now, whatever they had plotted between them was repeated unto the gods, their firstborn. When the gods heard this, they were astonished, then lapsed into silence and remained speechless. Superior in wisdom, accomplished and resourceful, Ea, the all-wise, saw through their design, made artful his spell against it, surpassing and holy. Are you picking up on this? Spells. They're from the very beginning. And I, this is just my personal belief, if I could have a relationship that I never fully grasped or understood, and today where I stand, why would it not be the same probability of my having a relationship with any god or goddess? Hmm. Whew. <laughs> made artful his spell against it, surpassing and holy. He recited it and made it subsist in the deeps. Magic. As he poured sleep upon him, sound asleep he lay. When he had made Absu lie prone, deep in sleep, Mamu, the advisor, was powerless to stir. He loosened Absu's band, tore off his tiara, removed his halo, and put it on himself. Having constrained Absu, he slew him. Mamu, he bound and locked. 
Having thus upon Absu established his ascendance, he laid hold of Mamu, holding him by the nose rope. After Ea had vanquished and trampled down his foes, had assured his triumph over his enemies, in profound peace he rested in his sacred chamber. He named it Absu, for shrines he assigned it. He founded his cult in that same place. Ea and Demkina, his wife, dwell there in splendor. In the chambers of fates, the houses of destinies, a god was engendered, most able and wisest of gods. In the heart of holy Absu was Marduk created. He who begot him was Ea, his father. Now, Teamut renewed the conflict and created an army of monsters. This time, even the great Ea could not withstand the attack and the gods decided to ask the young Marduk to defend them against Tammut. Lord Anshur, the father of the gods, rose up in grandeur, and having pondered in his heart, he said to the Anunnaki, He whose strength is potent shall be our avenger. He who is sharp in battle, Marduk the hero. Ea called Marduk into his secluded presence, Giving counsel, he told him what was in his heart. Marduk came forth, the wisest of gods, your son. His heart prompted him to face Tiamat. He opened his mouth, saying to me, If indeed, as your avenger, I am to vanquish Tiamat and save your lives, convene the assembly and proclaim supreme my destiny. When jointly in the Ub Shukina, he sat down rejoicing. Let my word, instead of yours, determine the fates. What I may bring into being shall be unchangeable. Neither dismissed nor replaced shall be the command of my lips. Now hasten hither and promptly fix for him your decrees, that he may go forth to face your mighty foe. They erected for him an ample throne. Facing his fathers, he sat down, presiding. You are the most honored of the great gods. Your decree is unrivaled. Your command is on you. You, Marduk, are the most honored of the great gods. Your decree is unrivaled. Your word is on you. From this day, unchangeable shall be your pronouncement. To rise or bring low, these shall be in your hand. Your utterance shall be true. Your command shall be unimpeachable. No one among the gods shall tra transgress your bonds. Adornment being wanted for the seats of the gods, let the place of their shrines ever be your place. O Marduk, you are indeed our avenger. We have granted you kingship over the entire universe. Your word shall be supreme when you sit in assembly. Your weapons shall not fail. They shall smash your foes. O Lord, spare the life of him who trusts you, but pour out the life of the God who seized evil. Having placed in their midst a piece of cloth, they address themselves to Marduk, their firstborn. Lord, truly your decree is first among gods. Say, but to wreck or create, it shall be. Open your mouth, the cloth will vanish. Speak again, and the cloth shall be whole. At the word emerge from his mouth, the cloth, the cloth vanished. He spoke again. His father saw the outcome of his word. When the gods, his fathers, saw the outcome of his word, joyfully they paid homage. Marduk is king. They confirmed on him the scepter, throne, and vestment. They gave him unequaled weapons that ward off the foes. Go and terminate the life of Tiamat. May the winds bear her blood to places undisclosed. Marduk's destiny thus fixed, the gods, his fathers, caused him to go the way of success and achievement. He construed a bow, marked it as his weapon 
attached thereto the arrow, grasped in his right hand. He raised the mace, grasped it in his right hand. He hung bow and quiver at his side. In front of him, he sat the lightning. He filled his body with blazing flame. He made, he then made a net to enfold Tiamat. He stationed the four winds that nothing of her might escape, the south wind, the north wind, the east wind, and the west wind. Close to his side, he held the net, the gift of his father, Anu. He brought forth Imhula, the evil wind, the whirlwind, the hurricane, the four wind, the sevenfold wind, the cyclone, the matchless wind. Then he sent forth the seven winds he had brought forth. To stir up the inside of Tiamat, they rose up behind him. Then the Lord raised up the flood storm, his mighty weapon. He mounted the storm chariot, irresistible and terrifying. He harnessed and yoked it to a team of four, the killer, the relentless, the trampler, the swift. Sharp were their poison-bearing teeth. They were versed in ravage, skilled in destruction. On his right, he posted the smiter, fearsome in battle. On the left, the combat, which repels all the zealous. His cloak was an armor of terror. His head was turbined with the fearsome halo. The Lord went forth and followed his course. He set his face towards the raging Tiamat. He held a spell between his lips. A plant to put out poison was grasped in his hand. Then they miled about him, and the gods milled about him. The gods, his fathers, milled about him. The gods milled about him. The Lord approached the scan, the inside of Tiamat, and of King Gru, her consort, the scheme to proceed. As Murdoch looks on King Gu's course becomes upset. His will is distracted, and his maneuvers are confused. And when the gods, his helpers, who marched at his side, saw the valiant hero, blurred became their vision. Without turning her neck, Tiamat emitted a cry, molding savage defiance in her lips. Too important are you for the Lord of the gods to rise up against you. Is it in their place that they have gathered, or in your place? Thereupon the Lord raised his mighty weapon, the flood storm, and the enraged Tiamat, he spoke the following words, Why have you risen? Why have you arrogantly exalted? You have charged your own heart to stir up conflict. Sons reject their own fathers, while you, who have borne them, has for, uh, forsworn, forsworn love. You have appointed Kingu as your consort, while you who have borne them, excuse me, conferring upon him the rank of Anu, not rightfully his, against Anshar, king of the gods, you seek evil. Against the gods, my father, you have confirmed your wickedness. Though you have drawn up your forces, ready your weapons." Stand alone, that I and you may meet in single combat. When Tiamat heard this, she was like one possessed. She took leave of her senses. In fury, Tiamat cried out aloud. To the roots of her legs shook both together. She recited a charm, keeps casting her spell, while the gods of battle sharpen their weapons. Tiamat and Marluk Rest wisest of gods then joined the battle. They strove in single combat, locked in conflict. The Lord spread out his net to enfold her. He let loose in her face the evil wind, which followed behind. When Tiamat opened her mouth to consume him, he drove in the evil wind, and she could not douse her lips. As the fierce winds encumbered her belly, her body was distended and her mouth was open wide. He released an arrow. It tore her belly. It cut through her insides, splitting her heart. Having subdued her, he blotted out her life. He threw down her carcass and stood upon it. After he had slain Tiamat, the leader, Woo! her band was shattered, her troop broken up. 
and her helpers, the God who marched at her sides, trembled with terror and turned their backs in order to save and preserve their lives. The lesson here, encircled tightly, they could not escape. He made them captives and he smashed their weapons. They found themselves ensnared in a net, torn into cells. They were filled with wailing. Bearing his wrath, they were held imprisoned. And the eleven creatures, which she had charged with awe, the band of demons that marched before her, he cast into fretters and their hands. For all their resistance, he trampled them underfoot. And Kingu, who had been made chief among them, he bound and accounted him to be the Uge. Whew, what a freaking battle. And Tiamat is not, wasn't it the planet that was destroyed? He took from him the table of fate, not rightfully his, sealed them with a seal and fastened them on his own breast. When he had vanquished and subdued his adversaries, had the vainglorious foe, had wholly established Anshar's triumph over the foe, New Demud's desire had achieved valiant Marduk, strengthened his hold on the vanquished gods, and turned back to Tiamat, who he unbound. The Lord trampled on the legs of Tiamat. When his unspiring mace, he crushed her skull. When the arteries of her blood he had severed, the north wind bore it to places undisclosed. On seeing this, his fathers were joyful and jubilant. They brought gifts and homage to him. Then the Lord paused to view her dead body, that he might divide the monster and do artful works. He split her like a shellfish into two parts. Half of her he set up as the ceiling of the sky. He pulled down the bar and posted guards. He ordered them not to allow her waters to escape. Wow. <clears throat> he crossed the heavens and surveyed the regions. He squared Absu's quarter and abode of the Nimdumud. As the Lord measured the dimensions of Absu, the great abode, its likeness he fixed as the Esherah. The great abode, the Esherah, which he made the firmament. Anu, Enyel, and Ea, he made occupy their places. He constructed stations for the gods, aligning their astral likenesses as constellations. He determined the year by assigning the zones. He set up three constellations for each of the 12 months. After defining the days of the year by names of astrological figures, he founded the station of Nibiru to determine their divine bands, that none might transgress or fall short. Alongside, he set up at the stations of Enyel and Ea. Having opened up the gates on both sides, he strengthened the locks to the left and to the right. In her belly, he established the zenith. The moon he caused to shine, the night to him in trusting. He appointed them a creature of the night to signify the days. Monthly, without cease, from design with a crown, at the month's very start, rising over the land. You shall have luminous horns to signify six days, on the seventh day reaching half crown. At full moon stand in opposition in mid-month. When the sun overtakes you at the base of heaven, diminish your crown and retrogress in light. At the time of disappearance approach you the course of the sun. And on the 29th, you again stand in opposition to the sun. There's that number 29. It was Kingu who contrived the ups rising and caused Tiamat to rebel and join battle. They bound him, holding him before Ea. They imposed on him his guilt and severed his blood vessels. Out of his body, they fashioned humankind. He imposed upon it the service and let free the gods. After Ea, the wise, had created humankind, he imposed upon it the service of the gods. That toil was beyond human comprehension. 
as artfully planned by Marduk, did new new Demud create it. Marduk, the king of the gods, divided all the Anunnaki above and below. He assigned them to Anu to guard his instructions. Three hundred in the heavens he stationed at guards. Um, and then we can read the rest of what we just read. Those were wow. Um, <laughs> let me go back here. Ah, uh, that's it. Okay. So we go into the verses. It says, Ea had not been created. The ancients believed that naming a thing was in itself an act of creation. These are the uh, footnotes. Uh, two, probably an epitaph in the sense of mother, not to be confused with the visor, Mamu, who mentioned. Fresh waters, or Absu, the salt waters, Tiamat, had not yet been separated. Uh, number name for Ea is Enki, the god of the earth and water. I don't know, would that make Tiamat maybe one of the same? Uh, let's see, this motif of younger gods becoming more powerful than the older gods and eventually supplanting them is central to almost all the mythological cycles of the Near East and the Eastern Mediterranean. It represents what may be thought of as the ultimate generation gap. Here, this theme also symbolizes the process of creation because the forces of nature, the gods, become more differentiated and defined. Hmm. And if you want this, I have this. So there you go. Um, so then this leads us right into uh, where we picked up yesterday when I brought this up to, uh, with um, Trina and Jenny. So we had gotten through... Um, I think right about here is where we had picked it up. Yeah, I think this will make sense now. It says, even though Tiamat, the myth of creation, which inspired the work of this grimoire, are derived from the ancient Babylonian lore, the ritual system presented here can hardly be called Babylonian magic. As I read yesterday, it does not claim to be such. There are no archaeological findings or historical accounts that would confirm any form of worship of the primordial gods or demonic beings created by the dragon goddess. The only mentions of demons and evil spirits are found in exorcisms and banishing formulas. Therefore, the ritual presented in this book do not revive any ancient traditions and are not reconstructions of any lost magical system. Instead, they constitute a framework for the application of the Gnosis that was revealed through the teachings of the demon gods themselves and are laid down here specifically for those who seek self-deification in the modern world. Then this book of the occult practices uh, is the practitioner's best tool. Um, we just read the foremost inspiration for the work described in this book was from the Babylonian epic known as the Enuma Elish. We just read that. Uh, the research literature on the myth of creation is almost solely focused on Marduk and his role in Babylonian magic and religion, while Tiamat and her children are hardly mentioned at all. The only available information is the analysis of the 11 demon gods from the linguistic perspective and their occasional metaphorical interpretations, such as their connection to astrology, which is the domain which made the Babylonians famous across the ancient world. The original material meaning, magical meaning, however, seems to be lost. In this book, there are no rituals or workings devoted to Murdoch. I leave this field to his followers and devotees. This is the book of Tiamat and the primal demon goddess who were born in her black waters of chaos. Hence, we will look at each demon god from their historical and linguistic meaning as well, but the main purpose of this grimoire is to present the children of Tiamat from their esoteric perspective, and to explore their magical powers as they manifest into the modern practitioner. The linguistic 
an astrological interpretation quoted in this grimoire is based on such works as Stephen Lagoon's Babylon Epic of Creation, F.A.M., Wiggaman's, and the Mesopotamian Protective Spirits, and Leonard King's Inu Elish, The Seven Tablets of Creation. For other sources, it is recommended to view the bibliography list by the end of this book. The occult interpretation and practical part of this grimoire is based on materials gathering during my personal work with Tiamat and her demon gods in the years 2007 through 2012. The work started as a magical project conducted by Lodge Megan, the occult ritual group that was founded in the beginning of the last decade in order to earth and to channel the draconian current through practical application of the left-hand path. The philosophy, the purpose of the project, which started by the end of 2007, was to gather information about the nature of the 11 spirits, their magical powers and methods of how they can be used for self-initiatory work in the magic of the 21st century. The project was also conducted in several phases according to carefully chosen curriculum, which included a wide spectrum of practices, from simple visual meditations, scouring, dream travels, to more advanced works of invocation, evocation, journeys through hidden gateways and dimensions, and exploration of forgotten worlds and lost temples. How many of you would like to go on that kind of a journey? Because I think as we continue to go forward, this would be a good place where I think we could do a private uh, meeting on Zoom where we could actually get into some of the more deeper aspects of this. L email me and let me know that you, if you're interested in this. And I'll, I'll probably do it one day during the week. Um, and I'll figure out a time which may work best. All right. So the teaching presented on the pages of the grimoire are derived from my personal experience, but they were also tested by ritual friends, partners, and those who sought knowledge and power in the Gnosis of the primal dragon goddess. Those reluctant to work with unverified Gnosis will not find it here. All rituals described in this book were performed and their results were verified to prove their efficacy, both through self-initiatory work and through manifestation of their results on the physical plane. Therefore, they provide a solid ritual system which lays foundation for the further work with this forgotten Gnosis. It is my personal hope and wish that this book will find its way into the hands of those who will not hasten to embark on the journey to the womb of darkness, reach for the primordial wisdom and power in carrying the dragon fire as a torch to illuminate the path for others. What a perfect place to wait till tomorrow. And we shall. Don't be afraid, folks. So we'll get in tomorrow the primordial draconian gods. We're going to get to know these individuals. I do believe they exist. I believe they are, in fact, as real as you and I. And we'll get into more tomorrow on Tiamat, get a chance to know her a little bit better and have a maybe clear understanding of who she is, what her purpose still is, and why such shows as this, bringing and speaking of this becomes a part of that resurgence of knowledge. So I hope you've enjoyed it. Uh, I'm just reading. Fantastic. Again, when we get into the ritual parts, I'm not sure I'll actually do them on air, you know, but... I think it would be very interesting, and I only want those who are really dedicated, you know, not, you know, experimenting, but those who, you know, are coming in with 
an understanding of, you know, that other world of which we're all a part of. <laughs> they look at us and they go, that's the other world. <laughs> uh, anyway, uh, thank you, Nina. Cool, cool, cool. Um, I'll go back and read uh, the chat room. I always do. I always sign your uh, comments and the conversations that y'all carry on with are just marvelous, baby. They're just marvelous. So really good stuff, isn't it? I mean, listen, what can it hurt? What we see going on today is madness. And I don't think it's going to be letting up any time at all. And again, this is just an impression I get. There's a, it's almost as if there's a calling. And I think this is like a partnership. One can't operate without the other. And yeah, I mean, most of the people I know here, and many of you have followed me for years, um, you know, I don't see the avarice, the greed, the the ego at play. It's just the opposite. That's the type of grounding one needs. And again, as I have said to you before, I've done battle with these beings. You know what? They say, know your enemy. You know why they say that? Because your enemy just may become your best friend. <laughs> uh, so, Aaron, anyway, everyone, I hope that you found this to be at least knowledgeable and, you know, expanding. Let's just put it that way. Um, <laughs> Steve, way to go, brother. How are you doing, by the way? Uh, by the way, Nina has her new channel it's in there. Uh, it's called the, is it the hump day message? Is that right? Yeah. So make sure to go over there, subscribe and on her rumble channel. And by the way, go there and subscribe on my rumble channel. What's up with y'all? I looked over there, you know, I, I, and somehow I got turned off because all these videos go transfer over there. And somehow they got turned off and I turned it back on. So do me a favor, go over there and subscribe, you know, <laughs> Hey, John Price, how you doing? All right, everybody. Doctor, uh, thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Scotty. Appreciate that. Um, yeah. Let's do some magic. We can do that. Zoom is a, you know, whatever format you use. I mean, it's just like being there. It really is. Now, granted, it's nothing like actually having a circle where you can actually uh, build up the energy, but, uh, yeah. And I'll share something with you in the art of magic and particularly where your energy is concerned, there is a exercise you can do. And the exercise is to get your hands, get them like this, and then bring them in and close your eyes. And the idea is do not touch your hand, but begin to feel that energy. And if you practice this, you'll actually feel it. You'll actually feel that. And that's the energy that really causes the magic to work. All right, boy, I've gone over time here. Thank you all. Have a great day. Pen Greedy, how you doing? And for Zon for so good to see you again, dear. Uh, send me an email. Let me know how that's going. Thank you, Joyce. Rick, right back at you. So, folks, much love. We'll pick this up tomorrow. I think this is good stuff. That's all, of course, that's my opinion. <laughs>